Good morning. Uh, if you don't remember who I am, my name is Greg. Uh, I'm, I'm the pastor here, and uh, it's good to be back with you after being away last week. Um, I was able to get together with some peers of mine, uh, some other ministers from around the southeast for a friend's installation service at a new church. When I was there, they kind of had this unspoken rule, actually it was spoken to a few of us, that when you go into the, the sanctuary, when you enter the worship space, you are quiet. <laughs> I don't think that's going to work here. And I'm really glad that it doesn't, because I love coming in and hearing you talking to each other and catching up, and um, I just, I love that feel. So welcome to all of you, and if you're a visitor with us, a special welcome to you. We have some visitor's cards that are in the pew pockets in front of you. Uh, and scattered around. If you want to fill one of those out, even with just your name, uh, we would love to better know you and know what to call you when we see you, and we promise we won't call you too much. But there are uh, offering boxes here and at the back of the sanctuary. Uh, you, can drop those, you can drop those visitor cards in those white boxes uh, along with any offerings you may want to give, uh, and we will be in touch with you and want to be of support or be of service in any way that we can. Uh, we do have a few announcements this morning. First of all, we have our newest offering from our children's ministry, God's Diner, which is going to be starting today. This is going to be a monthly uh, monthly thing. It'll be from 11.30 to 1.30 down in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, lunch will be provided for the kids with activities and lessons and games as we learn what it means to be fully accepted and loved by God and how we can share that with others. So looking forward to kicking that off today. We also have our monthly pride gathering this evening from 5 to 7 at Tadaro Pizza. All are welcome to come. Uh, it's a family-friendly environment. They have great food. Uh, we'd love to have you be there. And it's truly just a time to connect and build community uh, to get to know one another better. So we'd love to have you come to that. No RSVP, just feel free to show up. We also have some things happening next Sunday. So one week from today, right after church, uh, we have our Goal Network meeting. So Goal is Greenville Organized for Accountable Leadership. Many of you have participated in this Justice Network uh, that is a ministry of our church as well as 26 other congregations, interfaith and interracial congregations here in Greenville County uh, as we work together around issues of mental health, and affordable housing. We've already seen some huge successes and gains in our advocacy work together, and this will be an opportunity for those of you that have participated in that here in our church, with our church, to come together to get the updates on the successes and the gains, but also to collaboratively plan and look ahead to this spring when we have some really big initiatives and big events coming up. So if you've participated in any of these house meetings, if you came to the Community Problems Assembly, or if you come to the Nehemiah Action last year, or if you don't have any idea what any of those things are, and you just want to find out more, we'd love to have you Sunday right after church. Uh, we'll have some soups and such down in the Fellowship Hall, and then have our meeting. We've also got some youth events coming up. One is next Sunday. Uh, we're going to do a jam session after church. So we have so many talented young people that sing or play instruments of various kinds. So we're just inviting you to bring those instruments and hang out after the service and jam. And we'll have a few adults who do the same thing. Um, a great way to kind of share our talents and uh, share resources and, and get to know one another as well. So please make a point to uh, hang around for that. We've also got a youth ski trip coming up next month. Uh, this will be in... February, uh, President's Day weekend, and the deadline for that ski trip, as well as for our Passport Youth Camp coming up this summer, are both January 31st. So if you want more information about those, talk to Pastor Eric. He's coordinating and organizing those as well. I do want to share uh, some of our prayer concerns. You see a few of those printed on the back of your worship bulletin, but one to add is Ed Taylor, uh, one of our longtime members, um, he and his wife Janie have been members here since uh, the 50s. Um, they, uh, Ed has had some falls recently, had to be hospitalized as he recovers from those, and they're trying to figure out what the next steps might be. 
Uh, Janie herself is not in great health at home, uh, so just please pray for, for them, for that family. Uh, and I know so many of you have already offered support and calls and reached out over the weekend, so thank you for doing that. We're also going to be, over the course of this year, hearing from our different partners in mission each month. Uh, so I, uh, we're going to begin this month by hearing from United Ministries, and so I'll invite up, first of all, Don Cam, our Deacon of the Week, to lead us in our call to worship and opening prayer, and then Lizzie Bever, who is the Executive Director of United Ministries, will share a little bit more about their work and our partnership. Thank you again for being here. Let us worship together. Good morning. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. God, let gentleness be the air we breathe and the wisdom and wisdom the well we drink from. Wisdom from you, pure and strong, willing the wisdom that is mercy, a strong river of grace, a tree with life-giving fruits. May mercy be our muscles and gentleness our bones. And your wisdom the breath within our breath. Calm and resourceful, we face the world with courage and love born on your grace. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we answer this call to worship, we open our souls to your presence. You are the light of the world, and we invite your light to shine upon us. Fill us with your grace and wisdom, and help our worship this morning, and every day to be a reflection of our devotion to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Well, for those of you who may be new to United Ministries, just in case some of you don't know what we are, um, we're a nonprofit in the west end of Greenville along Pendleton Street in between Main Street and Academy. And we were formed 54 years ago when several congregations came together to pool their resources to serve mill families back when there were active mills um, in Greenville. And those families were struggling to cover things like rent, utility, and food. And over nearly five and a half decades, our mission at United Ministries has continued through the support of the larger community, which has evolved as the Greenville area has grown. And our vision is a Greenville community working together to ensure that everyone who comes to us has access to the resources that they need as well as the opportunities to thrive. And as a direct services organization, our mission is to serve individuals and families who are experiencing what we refer to as scarcity. By providing basic needs for stability and supportive services to achieve self-sufficiency. And so currently that looks like serving an average of about 3,000 people a year Many of those individuals, families with children, have been born into a generational cycle of poverty, the actual financial status, which in fact over 90% of those 3,000 people who begin working with us are living at or below the poverty line in Greenville County. And I don't know how many of you have pulled out your index <laughs> to tell you what that looks like, but for a family of four, that's under $28,000 a year. With, as you can imagine, and some of you might know, the challenges that come with a lifetime, or even worse, a generational cycle, of living without what you need can take a huge toll on people's lives. And like many of us, we all need places and people that we can depend on when life happens. So you may have heard that this community, really our whole nation, is in the midst of a housing crisis. Specifically, I want to talk to you from our perspective at United Ministries. That reality is beginning to hit hard, as most of the people that we serve, remember they're 90% and below the poverty line. 90% of them are at and below the poverty line. 
Well, most of them fall within what is 30% and below the area median income. So if somebody is trying to follow the standard rule, if any of you built a budget before, and if one day all of you children will build a budget, um, well, that means that you shouldn't spend more than 30% of your income on rent or your mortgage. And so 30% area median income in Greenville County, this is actually from 2021, so it's probably higher now, was $667 per month. And then fair market rent at the same time for a two-bedroom apartment was $1,051, almost double. So over the last few years, United Ministries has become more intentional about building out housing options for individuals and families with children. Currently, we have 20 apartments at Greenville Tech in partnership with Front Porch Housing and 16 single-family homes around Greenville County. We realized over the last few years that while our mission has been to provide quality services for people working towards long-term self-sufficiency, if they don't have access to adequate and affordable housing, those services aren't as effective, especially if we're trying to do long-term work. So additionally, we can't come up, as you can imagine, with those solutions alone. It's a community need, and our community must continue to grapple with the realities in front of us and develop creative and what I hope are spirit-led channels of response. For me, and for many of us here at Augusta Heights, this is an opportunity for us to listen to God's presence at work and to respond. So I'm just going to take a personal angle here and share with you what I've been thinking about in regards to this, both in my role at United Ministries and as a member of this congregation. In the Old Testament, so much of the prophet's work when it comes to hope is centered around holding this concept called moral imagination. And moral imagination is this concept of holding out the hope by being keenly aware of what's going on in the world and at the same time going beyond just lamenting the brokenness, admiring the problems, and calling us toward a vision of restoration and wholeness. So a few examples. Moral imagination can look like the ability to look at a boarded up house with the roof falling in, and instead to see a home that's been restored and prepared for the family who's living there. Moral imagination can move us from looking at resource disparities between our neighborhoods to envisioning equity in their place. Moral imagination empowers us to see possibilities beyond what our politicians have told us that our choices are, beyond what history has shown us what we've already tried, and on to new creations that take into account the hopes and the dreams of those most impacted by injustice. So my hope for our community and my role at United Ministries on behalf of our agency, but really authentically as a member of this congregation, is that as we face these big, big areas of need, that we'll lean into this concept of having moral imagination. That may be through, as Greg was just sharing about our, our involvement with the Gold Justice Network, who has a current focus on housing, or through volunteering at United Ministries, or maybe by showing up at city and county council to advocate for policies and funding that actually prioritize those who are at the bottom of the economic spectrum. And so it's my hope in sharing all of this with you that we might continue to work to see possibilities and as that call to worship that we just read, that we might have the courage to see them real. I'm excited to be able to offer the second sermon this morning. <laughs> that's it. That's, 
<laughs> That's a good word. Thank you. Elizabeth. Let's stand and sing together our opening hymn. It's number six in our green hymnals, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's sing together. children to come up for our children's message with Miss Tonda. Sorry, I thought there was going to be a fourth verse to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't want that. Okay, who can tell me the name of that song that we just sang? Did anybody catch the title of it and remember it? It's okay if you didn't. I'm just wondering. Welcome, friends. The name of that song that we just sang was called Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. It's such a catchy title. How did it not just stick forever in your brain? So it tells us two words that describes God. Immortal and invisible. So let's take the easy one first. Who can tell me what invisible means? Yes? Not being able to be seen. So is God invisible? Yeah, we can't really see him with our eyes, can we? That's not how we sense his presence with us. Okay, now the hard one, immortal. Yes? Do you have an idea? Live forever. Live forever. Very good. That's very good because that is not a word that you hear a lot, is it? It's not even a word that grown-ups use a lot. But immortal means, like you said, you live forever. Uh, other words that mean that describe immortal are um, everlasting, never ending, eternal, and I bet y'all know this one to infinity and beyond, right? <laughs> so infinite. So if something is immortal, it means it never dies, it lasts forever, it goes on forever. And that is a word forever that you've probably heard that we use, isn't it? Yeah? I was thinking of some things that we say last forever or take forever. And I was thinking about the holiday that we just celebrated last month in December. What was that? Y'all can just say it out loud. Yeah. Christmas. So does it seem like the next Christmas will be here any day now? Or does it seem like it's forever before Christmas comes around? Forever, yeah. I was thinking about where a lot of y'all go every day, Monday through Friday. You start in August. And this year you finish up a little early in May. Where is that? School. School. Does it seem like school lasts forever? Yes. That, oh, good. Some of y'all like school. <laughs> Sometimes, when I remember when I was in school, it seemed like not only the school year, but the school day lasted forever, especially on Fridays when you're waiting for the weekend, right? Yes. And when summer break does get here and your family has a trip planned, maybe to the beach or the mountains, does it seem like it takes forever for your vacation week to get here? Yeah. My family, we used to go to the beach in August, but then we started going in June because it was taking August forever to get here every summer. So we just moved it on up. Yeah. So say if you go on vacation, maybe to an amusement park like Dollywood, or maybe it's your big Disney trip. 
When you pick out the ride you want and you get in line, does it seem like before you know it, you're at the front of that line on the ride? Or does it seem like forever? Sometimes on the good rides, it seems like you wait in line forever, doesn't it? Yeah. So these are things that we say are forever, but they're not really. We know they're not. We're just being overly dramatic, right? Because everything eventually, eventually Christmas comes again, school's out, you go to on vacation, and eventually you get to the front of that line. Because the only thing that really is forever is what? God. Yeah, God and Jesus. A little bit later in the service, we're going to read our Bible verses, and today they come from the book of Psalms, chapter 111. And it's a short chapter, there's only 10 verses. But four times in those 10 verses, it mentions forever to describe God. It says that God's righteousness, which is his goodness, is forever. God's precepts, which are God's rules, are forever. God's promise is forever. And God's praise is forever. So when you think about God, I want you to remember that, that God is with you now. He's been with you since you were born, and he will be with you all of your days. He never leaves us. He is with us forever. Let's say a prayer together. God, we thank you that we never have to be without you, that you will never leave us, that although we can't see you, we feel your presence, and we know that you are with us forever and ever. Amen. Um, I always look forward to starting at church each year, not because I do loads of introspection as I sit there with a small piece of paper casually sitting in my pocket for the remainder of the service. No, I look forward to it because people get their word and have a couple of different reactions. There are those that roll their eyes because this is just too fitting. There are others who look pensive and ready to take on the challenge of their word. Me? I reached in and pulled out the word wisdom, a word that I'm a pro at and need no further work on, so that's all. Thank you. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, my first action after receiving my star word, like many others, was to hit up dictionary.com and make sure that the definition in my head was indeed accurate because as Ellen, my wife, so kindly points out regularly, my use of words like ornery are absolutely incorrect. <laughs> so, what did Webster have to say? Well, Webster said three different things. One, the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. The quality of being wise. Number two, the soundness of an action or decision with regard to the application of experience, knowledge, and good judgment. And number three, the body of knowledge and principles that develops within a specified society or period. There are words that run deeply through these definitions. Experience, knowledge, and good judgment, all of them imply a building process. These things don't simply happen, they develop. As the last definition states with time. There are pieces of each definition that struck me. Good judgment, soundness of action or decision and principles. These are my focuses in the coming years to build up experience and knowledge in such a way that allows me to have good judgment, soundness of action and decision, and principles of which are solid and rooted in what's right. Recently, I watched a series on Netflix titled Live to 100. I don't know if anybody else has seen it, but it's fantastic if you haven't. This series traveled to concentrated areas around the world with a high number of centenarians. They watched and studied their day-to-day -day lives, interviewed them about their experiences, and ask them what they believe to be the secret to living to 100. There were plenty of commonalities, diet, movement, faith, community. But what struck me 
was how much these generations are valued. They aren't strains on a system or burdens to bear. They are lives to be cherished and wisdom personified. They lived through a world war of famine, poverty, sickness, and heartbreak. Each spoke of hard things, but mostly they spoke of what they learned from them. These folks fascinate me, and even through a computer screen from thousands of miles away, they shared their wisdom with me. So, I pray that I spend time in 2024 sitting with and listening to folks who know not just more, but know better. I pray for a passion for learning reignited. I pray for wisdom to do and be better, to make good, necessary changes, to fervently fight the desire to sit and stay in my sameness. I pray for the courage to just take one step, the first step, because wisdom tells me that others will follow. I hope to have a profound understanding that wisdom isn't simply knowing. It's knowing that can and should impact doing. Wisdom should change me, and I pray that each wisdom encounter does just that. The other thing I did when I got home from church that day was grab my computer and search for quotes about wisdom. Here are three of my favorite. Number one, never mistake knowledge for wisdom. One helps you make a living, and the other one helps you make a life. Number two, a loving heart is the truest wisdom. And number three, wisdom is the byproduct of living. May we all grow in wisdom and grace this year. Amen. And may we all stand and sing together once again. <laughs> Hymn number 60, Be Thou My Vision.
Today is from Psalm chapter 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart, in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All, who, all those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. And then a poetic reading, an excerpt from Consolations by David White. Human beings are always and always will be a frontier between what is known and what is not known. The act of turning any part of the unknown into the known is simply an invitation for an equal measure of the unknown to flow in and reestablish that frontier, to reassert the far horizon of an individual life, to make us what we are, that is, a moving edge between what we know about ourselves and what we are about to be. Wisdom is not clarity or transparency or knowing how everything works. It is a fiercely attentive form of humility and thankfulness, a sense of the privilege of a particular form of participation, coming to know the way we hold the conversation of life, and perhaps above all, the miracle that there is a particular something rather than an abstracted nothing. And we are a very particular part of that particular something. We are neither what we think we are, nor entirely what we are about to become. We are neither purely individual, nor fully a creature of our community, but an act of becoming. As we talk about wisdom today, and as we look at this psalm, in some ways it almost sounds like the psalmist is introducing God as a guest speaker, going through all of God's attributes and accomplishments. Now we'd like to welcome to the stage the Lord. Let's give him a big round of applause as he comes up here, and I'll tell you a little more about him. The Lord's works are so great. They've been studied by many others. God, can I, can I call you God? Has established and kept covenants. The Lord sent redemption to his people, giving them the heritage of the nations and providing them with food. The works of God's hands are just and faithful, and the Lord has gained great renown for all of his wonderful needs. 
and ought deeds. And on a personal note, let me just say thank you with my whole heart. And I hope that you all will join me as we welcome and praise the Lord. <laughs> but then in that very last verse, it's like the psalmist breaks the fourth wall and turns and stares out at us from the page. They go from praising God's attributes and all that God has done and turn the attention on us. Almost as if to say, and don't you forget, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and all who practice it have good understanding. The fear of the Lord, now that's a loaded phrase. Unfortunately, too many of us have grown up with and internalized an unhealthy fear of the Lord of a God who is punitive instead of redemptive, cruel instead of caring. And if that is your association with the God who is love, I am sorry that you were told that and that you were told that. Because the fear of the Lord of which the psalmist speaks doesn't refer to the terror that is so often preached from pulpits. Instead, the fear of the Lord, here and really throughout Scripture when we see that phrase, refers to a respect, a praiseworthiness that is our response to God's goodness and grace. And regardless of what you may have heard anywhere else, God is always good and always gracious. The fear of the Lord is our reverence and honor for the God who has done all of these great things of which the psalmist speaks. And the psalmist writes, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now my guess is if I asked you to come up with a mental image of wisdom, you might picture some old man, of course it's always a man, right? Hermited on a high mountain, up in the clouds, answering pilgrims' questions about the meaning of life and giving abstract, esoteric responses. But wisdom, at least in our biblical tradition, is much more grounded in the everyday realities of our lives than it is high up on a mountain or floating in the clouds somewhere. Wisdom, as the scriptures characterize it, is how we find our way through those realities faithfully. Faithful to God and to who God is calling us to be. Aristotle called it phronesis, or practical wisdom. He believed it wasn't enough simply to be a person who understood or pursued, or pursued virtue in an abstract way. He saw a need for practical wisdom, since even our best virtues can become our worst faults if we don't practice them wisely. A frugal person can shrivel into a miser. Courage can devolve into recklessness. Self-reliance can harden into stubbornness. And for Aristotle, practical wisdom meant combining the moral will to want to be virtuous, what we might call faithful, with the moral skill to know how to do that. Or to put, an, put it another way, practical wisdom is the ability to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason in the real world. Take hospital janitors, for instance. If you look at their job description, it's probably what you would expect. Mop the floors, change the linens, restock the cabinets, clean the bathrooms, empty the trash. And while the list of tasks may be long, rarely do any of them involve other human beings, if you look at their job description. The janitor's job would be the same at a mortuary as it is in a hospital, at least on paper. But as psychologist Barry Schwartz shared in a TED Talk a number of years ago, when these janitors were interviewed to get a sense of what they thought their jobs were like, interviewers learned these amazing stories of one janitor who stopped mopping the floor in the hallway because Mr. Jones was walking up and down trying to get his strength back and the janitor didn't want it to be slick. They heard from another custodian who washed the floor of a person's room twice, a comatose patient, 
because the patient's father didn't see it and was upset and worried that it wasn't being cleaned. They heard from a housekeeper who ignored her supervisor's instructions to vacuum the visitor's lounge because there was a family in there that had been there for 72 hours straight and they happened to be taking a nap at the moment. Behavior like this from janitors, from technicians, from nurses, from doctors, is wise because it is the right and the righteous thing to do in those situations. It's not a list of assigned duties, but such behavior actually improves the quality of patient care. It helps hospitals to run well. And of course, not all janitors are like this, but those who understand that these sorts of interactions involving empathy and kindness are an essential part of their job are the ones who are being faithful to their larger call. And they are wise, not just because they have that moral will to want to do what is right by other people, but also because they have developed the skill to know what doing right looks like in a given situation. When you ask these janitors how hard it is to learn their job, they'll tell you that it takes a lot of experience, not to mop floors or empty trash cans, but to learn how best to care for other people. It takes experience. With some successes and some failures, some missteps, joys and sorrows, some struggles, to learn how to do the right thing the right time, for the right reason, in the real world. And usually that's how we gain wisdom, from experience. From our own, sure. I mean, it only takes one experience of singeing the hair off your face to grow wise enough not to light a bonfire with gasoline. Some of you know that story. But we also learn from the experiences and the wisdom of others and particularly from others whose lives are not only different and diverse from our own, but often more difficult. I want you to think of the wisest person you know, like know personally. The wisest person that you know. My guess is they've had all kinds of life experiences. Their lives have not been free from difficulty or suffering, but full of ups and downs, hardship and hurt and loss and love and joy and grace. Dr. Rachel Naomi Remen, whose work focuses on people who have been diagnosed with cancer, said in an interview that the keepers and teachers of wisdom in our culture are those who have experienced the most and often the most Hardship. As she puts it, the view from the edge of life is so much more clear than the view that most of us have. So maybe these are exactly the voices that we need to hear. The voices of wisdom are the voices of people who have faced tragedy and trauma, who have suffered and struggled, offering insight into their pain, calling us to a greater understanding and hopefully greater empathy, guiding us towards righteousness, towards justice, towards compassion, towards wisdom. And I wonder what kind of wisdom we might gain when we do listen. What kind of understanding and insight? What kind of compassion? Well, if nothing else, my guess is we will likely come to realize or maybe to discover all over again what the psalmist's soliloquy of praise reminds us. That God is worthy of praise for all that God has done. That God is good and faithful and gracious. And maybe most of all, that God is God and we are not. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a respect and a recognition of who God is and who we are, and in that a recognition that we don't have all of the answers, that we don't have the most incisive insight, that we don't have to. In fact, we might just find that the most foolish thing we can do is to think ourselves wise 
and to stop listening and learning and asking and searching. If we learn nothing else, maybe we can learn that the height of wisdom is to confess the depths of our own ignorance. That the wisest thing we can do is to humbly acknowledge the ways in which we are left wanting in wisdom. To admit our lack of understanding, our limitations and our shortcomings and our weaknesses. And to continue to seek truth. To seek God. To seek to be faithful, to keep asking questions, maybe even the ones that aren't allowed. Maybe especially the ones that aren't allowed. Hoping and praying and trusting that through our imperfect efforts, through our seeking and searching, God will lead us toward a more righteous, a more just, a more loving, a more faithful life. That is the purpose of wisdom, after all. The psalmist's praise is of all that God has done and continues to do. Great are the works of the Lord. Full of honor and majesty is God's work gained, renowned by God's wonderful deeds, the power of God's works, the works of God's hands are faithful and just, performed with faithfulness and righteousness. And then the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have good understanding. Wisdom has a purpose. It's not for navel-gazing. It's not for proving how much we know or how right we think we are. It is for instruction and understanding and insight. It is for the creation of righteousness and justice and equity. Wisdom is meant not only to be heard and to be understood, but to be applied. To be put into practice in our living, in our real world, in real time, in real life. To create a more faithful and just world. To live out the call of God upon each of our lives. To create what we hope will be a good and gracious community. And so we listen and we learn. We ask questions. We seek wisdom. And then we try to do what God would have us to do. And we may fail. Let me revise that. We will fail. We will get it wrong sometimes. But we keep listening. And we keep learning and we keep growing. In the words of Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. So we do the best we can. We make the wisest choices we can, grounded in who we know God to be, gracious and just, righteous and faithful, compassionate and caring. We keep struggling and striving and trying and asking and then trying and asking again, ready to act, taking one more step along the way, trusting that as we seek to live into God's purposes for us, God can and will and is working out God's good and gracious purposes for our world. God's faithful and just works. Maybe even through us. As God leads us all towards all that God would have us to do. Which sounds great, and I could probably say I'm in there, and you know, it's inspiring, but I know what the next question is. How do we know what to do? When it's a real decision with real consequences. <coughs> Do I marry her? Do we have a baby? Do I change jobs? Should I move places? How do I take care of my children? What do I do for my aging parents? What's the next right decision for a church? The Spanish priest and founder of the Jesuit monastic order, St. Ignatius, developed a practice around this. The people of faith seeking God's direction and wisdom have followed for centuries. Now I know after these past few weeks y'all are probably getting tired of little meditation things. Well, we got one more. <laughs> so if you will take a moment as we walk through this type of Ignatian discernment really to listen more deeply to see more broadly. You can close your eyes if you want to but you don't have to. And as much as you can in your mind try to free yourself from any 
preconceived notions or preferences or biases you may bring to this moment. Wisdom always begins with an openness to God. Now bring to mind a concern that you have in your life. Maybe it's an upcoming decision that's been weighing heavily on you. It might be something having to do with you or your family or a relationship or what you want to do with your life. Maybe it's about something you're wanting to give up or take on, a change that you see on the horizon. Whatever that may be, hold it in your mind, trying to release any assumptions you may have about it. Now try to clearly identify the question that you are trying to answer. What is it exactly that you are seeking direction Offer this question and concern to God, knowing that you do not carry the burden of this decision alone. As you do, pray for a holy indifference to the outcome. As much as possible, separate yourself from the process and allow God to lead. Take even your deeply held desires out of the process so that God's desires can emerge. Pray for wisdom, for clarity. And then in that spirit of prayer, look and listen deeply. Look at the events and patterns in your life that raise the question or the concern in the first place. Where did this come from? Listen to the voices of the people in your life that you trust, who have your best interests at heart and want you to be well and whole and faithful. Look to the stories of our faith and the truths of Scripture. Listen to the practical considerations, the pros and cons, the expenses of time, money, effort. Look within your own moral imagination, trying on the clothes of this decision, so to speak, envisioning what it might look like or feel like. Imagine the decision you think you're least likely to choose, too. Try that on as well. And as you do, listen to the deep emotions that surface, whether it's anger or delight or anxiety, or excitement. And after you have looked and listened deeply for God's presence and purposes, make a choice. And sit with that choice. And ask for confirmation that this is the right choice as you keep that spirit of prayer and openness and then trusting the faithfulness of your discernment, and even more so God's faithfulness with you, you have the opportunity to act. Even if questions or anxieties or uncertainties remain, you have the chance to do something. So take a step, whatever that may be, knowing that God goes with you as we all become more fully the people God created us to be and the people Christ is calling us to be. Amen.
discern God's wisdom at work within us and among us, and then we would put it into practice to become a living prayer. And if you have been discerning God's call upon your life to where you might want to join your life to this community of faith and follow more fully in the way of Christ, we invite you to make that decision, to make that response as we stand and sing our closing hymn which I have forgotten already. <laughs> and 395. 395, God of grace and God of glory. Let's stand and sing together. we go to live in these days, we do pray for wisdom. And we also pray that God would give us grace. Grace never to sell ourselves short. Grace to risk something big or something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take our minds and think through them. 
May God take our lips and speak through them. May God take our hands and work through them. And may God take our hearts and set them on fire this day, every day, and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace.